Welcome to David Icke's World Wide Wake Up Tour. Uh, my name is Norbert Lichtner and I'll be conducting an interview with David uh, today. All the questions are submitted by David's fans and followers from Czech Republic. Uh, there are 10 questions and I hope uh, you will enjoy the show. David, thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure. Are you looking forward to Czech Republic? Well, I am, not least because of what's gone before. Um, you know, I started out doing what I'm doing 26 years ago, and um, it was a lonely place. Uh, there weren't many people interested in it. There weren't many people um, actually communicating any information in, in any of these areas, really. Uh, there was no alternative media, as we have it today. There was uh, nothing like. Um, and uh, I had to go um, uh, looking for um, audiences. Um, like, um, I went around uh, the United States in 1996 for three months uh, talking to nobody. Uh, uh, and then um, the first time I went around Australia, um, it was in the back of a little car driving from and talking in the evening to the uh, people that turned up. Uh, and it seemed, um, it seemed a, an extraordinarily um, challenging task to get this, this other way of looking at the world um, out where people could see it. But what has happened over this um, last, what, over a quarter of a century um, has been amazing because now, um, I went around Australia, not in the back of a car this time, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, and uh, New Zealand. I talked to um, uh, full uh, theatres. Um, I've just uh, gone around uh, America, um, New York and Los Angeles and uh, San Francisco, and um, seen the reaction. And more than that, um, I have more and more people street all over the world wanting to um, talk about this information uh, and that is a real indicator of just how far it's getting out there not just the people that come to the events but people are aware of what you're doing and not just that but the kind of people you know a, a long time ago um, it was a certain kind of uh, a person who, who who was looking at the world in a different way and asking questions and the vast majority of people were not but now um, people if you like from within the system people with smart suits and ties are stopping me in the street and they want to talk to me about this information mm -hmm. so it's extremely encouraging and um, I'm gonna be very interested to see um, the response around uh, Europe uh, given what's happened up to this point uh, and and you know the the, um, the the signs are very good. Uh, um, I'm going to be talking in Italy and uh, Romania very soon um, after the Czech Republic. And um, the combined audiences of those two events will be 6,500, uh, which is an extraordinary number. Um, a, in a country, Romania, I've not been in before. But also to listen to someone talk for 10 hours, with breaks, of course, and lots of illustrations. But to talk for 10 hours on this information just is uh, indicative that, that there is a change going on. I'm seeing it. People are looking at things they would have waved away um, and dismissed by reflex action before. It's, it's very encouraging. Lots of challenging things going on in the world, um, all part of this plan that I've been uncovering and communicating, but, but still extremely encouraging compared with what it used to be like. All right, uh, I have to jump on to the questions from your uh, fans and followers in Czech Republic. The first question is, is everything what you present based on your own research or do you cooperate with different insiders and informators as are David Wilcock or Corey Goody? No, I've never met David Wilcock. Um, my way of doing things um, has it can be summed up by basically how I started this. Um, uh, I didn't start it consciously, I'm going to do this. It, it, it basically came into my life. 
And uh, to cut a long story short, um, through 1989, when I was a, a national spokesman for the British Green Party and uh, a television presenter with the BBC in London, I had this feeling that um, throughout that year, when I was in a room alone, I wasn't alone. And it got more and more powerful and more and more tangible um, until eventually, uh, through a series of coincidences, uh, I, um, I ended up um, at a psychic's uh, house, uh, not telling her anything that was happening to me, but just to see if she would pick up anything around me, because um, I'd never been to a psychic before. Um, uh, but this presence was so powerful. And what I was told um, by that psychic uh, over a couple of visits was that I was going to go out on a world stage and reveal great secrets, which was like extraordinary to me. I'm working for the BBC and I'm a, uh, speaking for the Green Party. Uh, and that um, I wouldn't have to basically go and find the information. The information would come to me. It would just come into my life. Uh, it would be put into my mind and, and, and it would be put into my life. And from that time, this we're talking now 1990, my life has just been this synchronistic um, experience journey of coming across information um, in, in, in um, documents, in books, personal experiences, meeting people, uh, and, and endless different sources which has been a bit like um, some, someone handing you the puzzle pieces to put them together. And, um, and it started out in the early 1990s with um, what you might call the, fir the five sense level of all this, names, dates, places, which I still do now, um, uh, connections, secret societies, etc. cetera. Um, and then it, it moved deeper and deeper in the rabbit hole, if you like, into some really far out areas, including the illusory nature of reality itself. And um, I, uh, I use endless different sources, personal experiences, um, to, to put this puzzle piece, these puzzle pieces together. And that is the reason, Norbert, why I, um, I talk for 10 hours, because it's not that I like the sound of my own voice, but there are so many dots to connect, so many strands to uh, to form the web uh, that it takes that long to um, to to make a go to B go to C go to D and and for the the picture to unfold and you know what what it, makes it, you sure that you are connecting the dots properly that you are doing it right well the point is that um, I put the dots together um, as I experience the information and then uh, people make up their mind what they make of it. That's the deal. There is no other um, motive. Um, what I've never done, and the last thing we want is another one of these, um, is say, this is how it is, you must believe it. What I'm saying is, there are other ways of looking at the world. And here are many ways of looking at different aspects of the world. Make of it what you will. But you know, when you um, write in books uh, in the mid-1990s uh, that this is the plan and this is what is, um, is, is planned for the world, a transformation of human society, global society, and then they're now basically reading my books on the television news in daily events and have been for some time then there is a cause and effect there. There is a, this is what was said and this is what is happening. And, and this is one of the major reasons why people are turning to what I'm doing in such numbers now. It's because it has the credibility of what was said is happening. And it's not just me. You know, when you um, look at different people, whether it's Aldous Huxley, Brave New World, whether mm. it's um, uh, the... Um, 1984 author um, Eric Blair, George Orwell, his writing name, or whether it's someone that I'm quoting in these events, um, a, a Rockefeller family insider from 1969, they have all described 
um, the world that we're in now, and we're moving into even more, all those decades ago, and being extraordinarily accurate in terms of this man I quote uh, from 1969 in the talks, um, stunningly accurate in detail. This man was describing the internet 20 years before it was officially uh, developed by the World Wide Web. Um, and this, it's a simple thing. There is an agenda for the world, and it's not projected into yesterday, uh, into uh, tomorrow afternoon. This is projected decades and decades ahead. And if you can access that agenda, then um, you can pretty accurately, in theme and often detail, predict the future. The idea, however, is not to be proved right. It's to alert people to, to, the, to, to what's actually unfolding, to the fact that these apparently random happenings in the world are not random, so that there's an intervention to stop it happening. That's the whole point of what I do. And that's what George Orwell was trying to warn people about in 1948. Now, all right, one question just from uh, from me. Uh, look, there are there are many many white papers. They've been published, you know, decades ago, and they are actually telling us what they are going to do with us or what their plans are, and people wouldn't believe them. How 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 can we change? Actually, there. Well, I think I, I think I think Robert, we 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 are at a very particular point in this sequence of events, uh, where it's more and more difficult for people to ignore it because it's in their face. For instance, um, I've been writing for a long time, saying for a long time that the plan was to create a third world war by playing the West off against Russia and China. Um, uh, to create a global conflict, because uh, they, they always planned three. Um, and there was no sign of that for a long, long time. But you look, you look now, you look at the systematic demonization of Russia, um, uh, how, how, how Russia is now in that uh, extraordinarily horrific uh, area of the world called Syria with all the other players. You've got the United States and Britain. They want to pick a fight. They want it to kick off. Um, and uh, the demonization of Russia is extraordinary. I mean, you know, uh, someone um, uh, hacks into the Democratic Party emails and, and it's, um, it's the Russians. So uh, it's very clear that we are being now prepared for that, um, that Third World War conflict. This is why people like John Kerry the Secretary of State in the United States. This is why Samantha Power in um, the uh, UN, the UN, uh, U US ambassador to the UN, are, are pouring out this vitriol and uh, um, a rhetoric and abuse uh, uh, about the, um, the, the actions and the alleged um, uh, plans of Russia because people are being prepared for this third world conflict. Now, um, the, the point is that you can, only, um, you can only keep something in the shadows for so long. If you want to transform society in a certain way, you can manipulate from the hidden and manipulate for the sh for, from, from the shadows for a long time. Yeah, but one day but, you have to come up. But there comes a point where to transform society in the image that you want, you have to manifest it in the world of the scene. And so what we're seeing now is this extraordinary, exactly what Orwell talked about. Um, and um, this guy in 1969 talked about this extraordinary level of gathering surveillance all over the world, much bigger than anything even people like Edward Snowden have come out with. Um, and, and then you, you start to look at the uh, gathering genetics uh, manipulation, the synthetic humans uh, uh, manipulation that's going on. You look at the transhumanist agenda, which is to get technology inside people, we externally control people's thoughts. Um, and uh, that, with all that, you're, you're into the realm of older Suxley and Brave New World, because the points I, I've, I've been making over the years is that 
Um, Brave New World in 1984 were not written from pure imagination. Both of those guys um, had access to what this projected agenda was. Orwell, almost to his dying day, was trying to warn people about it, and the police state and the the the, uh, the endless war, which we have, the war on terror. When do you know a war on terror has ended? You, you, no one can ever say. That's why they picked that as the war. Um, and and then you've got um, what uh, Aldous Huxley was talking about, also uh, uh, drugging uh, people to keep their minds under control. Uh, I've just come back from America, where the the drugging of children as a matter of course is extraordinary. It's straight off the pages of 1984, um, so uh, of uh, Brave New World. So are so are all these uh, genetic synthetic uh, genetic manipulations going on. So. It's getting harder and harder. And, I, and this is absolutely the reason, not just that more and more people are looking at this information, but the kind of people. It's because um, they, you really are going to have to uh, uh, um, go into a serious level of, of denial um, not to see that the world is changing in, uh, in, in very clear ways and um, where, 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 the, where the direction of the world is going. All right, can we uh, get back to the questions? Uh, the next question is, could you name some people whose works you would recommend to study for better understanding the world and what is going on behind the scenes? Well, I, I think if you, um, if you put Brave New World and 1984 together, you've got the basic picture. Um, and, and more confirmation that this has been going on and projected for a long time. Um, Brave New World looks at the genetic uh, manipulation, the creating of children in, uh, not in, in through procreation, but through uh, laboratory uh, means, which is exactly where this synthetic genetics is going. And George Orwell was looking at the, the, the police state, the surveillance, and the um, um, endless war. Um, and it's interesting that Orwell and uh, Huxley knew each other. Um, Orwell was taught French by Huxley at the elite Eton College, uh, where the royal children go. Um, so they had access to, to, to these, some of these inner levels where this knowledge of this agenda is held. And, you know, there, there, there are, uh, I wouldn't pick out any, anybody in particular. I mean, uh, what, I, what, I, what I do and, and, and you know, I, I recommend others to do is just use your own intuition um, about what books you read and, 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 and use your intuition on what you accept within those books and what, what you don't. You know, we, what we, we, we have to take our perceptions back This is absolutely crucial because, um, as I will go into uh, very early on in the event in, um, in Prague, um, people need to just to take a breath and look at why people think the way they do. And when you break it down, basically you enter this world as a, as a, as a, a child, a baby, and immediately, wham! You are in a perception programming um, uh, situation uh, where you, your parents influence your perceptions because of how, what they've downloaded from the system you're about to go through. Then you go through an education system, which is basically a download of the state's version of reality, of everything. Um, you have um, peer pressure uh, to conform to those norms that... Um, we are told are, are, are real and, and normal and, and uh, you're mad or crazy if you don't. Um, you have the mainstream media and much of the alternative media uh, pouring out um, this same basic version of normal. Um, and, and when you break it down, uh, what we're told is reality. What we're told is the world. What we're told is the reality we're interacting with. Never mind what we're told about world events. is absolute nonsense. Uh, and, and so when you have a situation 
where throughout your formative years and then on into adult life, you are constantly being bombarded with the same version of normal, basically. And it's a normal that operates in a stunningly narrow band of possibility. Uh, and, and the vast majority of people uh, download it and therefore go that through their lives believing it to be real. When it's not, it's nonsense. And this awakening that's happening now is that more and more people are actually looking at this normal, what I call the postage stamp uh, normal, um, and they go, well, hold on a minute. Maybe, maybe we should have a look at this. And when you look at it and, and you take it apart, you, you see the nonsense that, that uh, humanity is sold as the real world compared with what exists beyond it. And uh, so that's, that's the crucial thing. It's the deprogramming. David, not to what, believe what, is... what I say, not to believe what he says or she says, but for people to take their own perceptions back. What is the best way to wake up people who think that the current social system is good and the right one? Well, first of all, people have to be open to it. Um, you know, you, you know, you can't concrete mind uh, that, that says this is how it is and I'm not moving. But like everything, you know, if you're involved in, in what we're involved in, which is a perception deception, some manipulation of people's perceptions so that they see the world and themselves in a certain way. Then wh where do those perceptions come from? They come from, yes, personal experience, which is a form of information. And the rest of it comes from information resources. I'm talking about the education system, the, the uh, mainstream media, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so perceptions come from information. So if you're going to put uh, a question mark against the perceptions of this postage stamp normal, it's got to be through information. And that information has got to make sense to people. Um, the challenge you have is that the postage stamp normal is what people perceive the world to be. You can talk about that in, you know, a sentence or two, because there's no backstory before what you're saying makes sense to, to, to those who think this normal is real. With a, with, with a postage stamp normal, you can talk about things in a very um, uh, you know, short fashion because all the backstory is accepted. Yeah, I accept this is how it is. When you, people like me are challenging that, there's a whole backstory because before um, some of these um, more far out things that I talk about uh, make sense to people, there's so much information that has to go before. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. That's why I talk for so long. Um, but the power of the information is, is clear to see when people are put before it in, in the way it does make sense to them. And often people who come along out of curiosity and not believing or thinking it ever will make sense because of what they've heard about me. Um, but it does. And, and that's all you can do. You can only put out information and people then make of it what they will. You can't try to manipulate people into changing their minds. You can't try to trick them. I mean, if you do, you're just playing the game of the system you're, you're challenging. So it's just pure information. Just take every opportunity you can to get information out that challenges the information source that's coming from mainstream sources. And then people will see it or they won't see it. And... and that's what the outcome will be. Okay, to, so to sum it up, <clears throat> it means uh, that to put out the information and let the people uh, decide for themselves. Yeah, and, and if, if, you, if anyone has any idea of doing it differently, well, they are simply, uh, well, what, 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 I mean, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? Uh, uh, try to trick people into believing it or manipulate them into believing it? I, I mean, it's, what's the point of that? Either the information is powerful enough to stand up for itself, or it's not. Um, and, you know, the, um, the internet has been um, a godsend to people like me. We might have a trouble with that one in a couple of days. Yeah, um, it's been a godsend for people like me because um, it's allowed <clears throat> relatively up to this point the free flow of information 
which has um, allowed this information to circulate. However, um, when you look at the things that are now happening, um, then it's very clear that there is an unfolding agenda to uh, start censoring that big time. Um, and I, I was recently, actually just a few days ago, in Silicon Valley, the south of San Francisco, where this transhumanist madness is uh, actually being, um, was well, the engine room of it in so many ways. And there you find Google, you find um, uh, Facebook, and these internet giants. And they're not what they seem to be. Uh, there's an organization um, that is the technological development arm of the Pentagon called DARPA, one of the most sinister organizations on earth. And um, it is working hand and in glove with uh, people like particularly Google, but also Facebook. Um, the, uh, Google is massively into this transhumanist agenda. And through its domination of search engines and through Facebook's um, domination of social media and the circulation of information that way, um, they are being uh, they are working to the same agenda as DARPA out of the Pentagon. And this explains um, what would otherwise be a very, very strange career move by a lady called Regina Duggan. Regina Duggan was the director of DARPA. Uh, which gives to the world things like death rays and so on, um, because they haven't got enough ways to kill people yet. And it also um, claims, DARPA, that it was the creator at the start of the Internet. Now, the Internet's very important to them, but they, they want to keep the stuff, the side of it that's good for them. They don't want to keep the side of it that's bad for them, and that's the free flow of information. So Regina Duggan, this director of DARPA, suddenly um, resigns and becomes an executive of Google. Uh, you, you, you go, right, oh, oh, hold on. Um, technological development of the Pentagon, um, search engine, that's a bit of a career move. But of course it's not, because they are, they are working closely together on this transhumanist technological agenda. Then Regina Duggan leaves Google and goes on to do the same job now at Facebook, um, these uh, internet giants are coming together. They have uh, reached the point of domination now. Uh, of course, you've got YouTube, also owned by Google, where they think they can play the cards they were always going to play, which is um, fiercely censoring information that um, this hidden hand I'm talking about doesn't want people to know. So um, it's another one of the reasons that I've gone out on this open-ended world speaking tour, um, challenging as it is physically um, sometimes, because we've just got to do everything we can to get this information out to as many people as possible, because the, um, the, uh, the Internet means of communicating it is, is in the gun sights of these people. All right, David, we have to move to the next question. Different independent publicists talk about a big event which will change the world, for example, like 9-11. They talk about financial collapses, ecological catastrophes, epidemics, or false flag terrorist attacks. Is there a way how to tell when these things are in the pipeline? Well, well there's a very simple question when events happen in the world. So there's two things, uh, two things. Where, where are we being taken? Where is the world going? Um, and what I do in these events is set that out really early on. And then once you know that, and basically it's a centralized um, a fascist dictatorship with um, less than 1% at the top of the pyramid, everyone else at the bottom of the pyramid, and a fierce, merciless police state, police military state actually, um, in between the two to hold that status quo ongoing. So once you've got that um, in mind, and obviously there's more detail, then it's a simple question when events happen, whether it's a terrorist attack, whether it's a, a banking crash, whatever it is, a war, who 
benefits? Who benefits from this event happening? Who benefits from me believing the official story of these events and why they happened and who did them? And when you ask that question, who benefits in the light of these things, then um, again and again and again and again and again, and I can say it uh, uh, endlessly because that's how many times it's happened to me, you see that those who benefit from them are those that want to take this world further down the road to this structure I've just described, what I call the Hunger Games Society. So um, look at what is happening um, every time there's a terrorist attack. Um, there are uh, more uh, uh, um, laws on surveillance. There's more um, uh, laws on communication of information. There are more armed uh, people, uh, uh, police on the streets, uh, uh, you know, sometimes, often increasingly now, troops on the streets. And, and what is that doing? That's moving us more and more to this police state within that structure that I'm talking about. Have you, when, David, when, have you noticed that <clears throat> uh, a couple of days ago in Switzerland, they voted in the referendum uh, for bigger, full surveillance of the government, of the secret, or well, their secret uh, agents over the people. But I was talking about this on my radio show, and I tried to explain that the terrorists are actually communicating different way, not the way the normal people do. So this won't affect they, their communication. But have you, no, have you noticed that the, the Swiss voted for the surveillance on themselves? No, I didn't know. I didn't notice that because I've been traveling. I've, I've just been coming back from America in the last like uh, uh, three days. But uh, it, it, it absolutely makes sense uh, because there is a technique that I've, I've called for a long time um, problem, reaction, solution. And, and this is how the, these all these events play out. You want to change society in a way you couldn't do just by announcing this is what we're going to do. Because what you want to do is so extreme that people are saying, we're not having it. Uh, and why are you doing it? Well, there's no point. There's nothing, well, we, we don't need it. So what you do at stage one of problem, reaction, solution is you create a problem. You blame someone else for it or something else for it. You then get the mainstream media, easy, easy, to basically tell the people the official version of that happening. And at stage two, you want a reaction from the public. And that reaction is all based around a four-letter word called fear. Once you get people in a state of fear, they will give their power away to that which they think can protect them from what they've been manipulated to fear. So you've got your problem manufactured, you've got your reaction, fear and do something, and then you offer your solutions to the problems you've covertly created, which are to, to, to go on creating this structure of this Hunger Games society I talked about. So um, getting people in fear is crucial. It's all about fear. Uh, and um, of course, terrorist attacks, wars, uh, I mean, you know, the, and, and the, the fear that the fear that they might it might happen to you. These are all psychological uh, traumas that get people to give their power away. And, and what another area of this um, problem, reaction, solution that people need to be aware of is, um, and I've been saying since 2008, um, that financial crash, which was fundamentally engineered and manipulated, was not the end. It was, it was just the next stage. They won a massive financial crash, um, not least based on uh, using the so-called derivatives market, which is worth apparently hundreds of trillions of dollars uh, officially, but is worth next to nothing in reality. It's all a figment of the imagination. And uh, of course, now we're facing this situation at the moment with the, uh, the Deutsche Bank in Germany, which is uh, getting itself in uh, uh, serious trouble. Uh, and um, we could have a, a Lehman Brothers on our hands in Europe. And um, the idea is to um, create the financial banking crash and then deal with it in a different way. You know, I described that structure a few minutes ago of um, the less than 1% at the top, the police state under that, and then the rest of the population. The rest of the population, uh, 
when I say that, I mean basically the rest of the population. I mean people who think now that they're well off and, and they've got a nice house and money in the bank and it's not really their problem. Well, it is. Because if you're not in the less than 1%, they want what you've got as well. And so um, what we've seen in Europe increasingly, not least in the European Union, very, very significant in relation to finance. And that's the increasing replacement of the bailout response to banking crashes to the bail-in, where instead of um, governments giving money to banks to bail them out, which the public are then uh, responsible for paying, paying back, and so you have all the austerity justified, hunger game society. Instead of that, after 2011 in Cyprus with the banking crash there, the European Union, and it's happening elsewhere around the world as I travel, I check these things everywhere at the time I go into another country. The bail-in, where instead of um, uh, governments bailing out banks, um, the bank goes directly to the accounts of, of depositors and takes it, the bail itself out. Because when you put money in a bank, um, even, even that's only in theory, but when you put money in a bank, you're just an unsecured uh, a creditor if the bank crashes. Um, these are the things that uh, people need to become aware of uh, quick, because um, if we don't, then we'll see these events as random, we'll respond to them in fear, and we'll give our power away to um, respond to them, to the very people who create them, and this thing will go on. Well, this, this, this did happen <clears throat> in Cyprus. Next question uh, from your people is... <clears throat> More and more people can see that the current system is falling down. What do you think? When will this change occur and what has to happen before the change comes? Uh, we have to take um, power back from the few. Uh, and you can only do that by ceasing to cooperate with your own enslavement. You see, when you look at the numbers, it is absolutely staggering how few people are dictating to the lives of what more than seven billion it's extraordinary um, and they they are able to do it because people are are frightened of saying no to authority and this is crucial that which is manipulating from the hidden is um, seeking to divide and rule the target population in every way it can and play different parts of that target population off against each other. This is what's happening in Europe with, with the, the mass migration. It's been planned a very, very long time. This guy, I, I, I will quote in uh, Prague in 1969, describe what's happening today in 1969 and why it would happen. Um, and... Uh, you um, have the uh, blatant attempts in the United States, where I have been for the last nearly a month, um, to create a, a race war there and divide and rule. And um, these people um, in the hidden, uh, through their agents in the scene, like the billionaire George Soros, are seeking to divide and rule people in every way they possibly can. So there's two things, really, um, that need to happen. First of all, People of different colors, races, backgrounds, beliefs uh, need to realize that this is not a conspiracy to enslave um, that group or that group or that group or that race or that religion. It's to enslave all of us. And if we go on being divided and ruled and fighting among ourselves, they will do it. And the other thing is we have to stop cooperating with our own uh, enslavement and our children's enslavement even more so. So, you know, if, if someone comes out of a parliament building, it's a handful of people, and they say, um, we've decided to do this, which is actually um, uh, uh, deleting freedoms uh, of the people, whatever it is, um, they can only impose that if the people say, well, okay, well, it's the law, so we better, we better do it. What people have got to start doing en masse is saying, we're not doing that. We're not having this. This is not acceptable to us. We're not cooperating. And they have no chance. 
how can a handful um, uh, uh, dictate to a, a vast number of people that won't cooperate with a handful? But that's got to take um, that's going to take courage for people to say, I, 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 you know, I'm going to overcome my fear of authority, and I'm going to stand up for what I believe in, um, and uh, not just uh, cave in because some guy in a dark suit has said that I should. <laughs> there will be a presidential election in the United States in November. People have noticed Hillary Clinton's poor health. Do you have an update uh, or updated information about her health? And does she use doubles for public appearances? Well, um, I, I've seen many elections in my life, but traveling around America in the last uh, nearly a month, I mean, I mean, this this is a puppet show. This is this is a circus going on. You know, we've got three hundred and twenty million Americans, and they've been given a choice because the way the system is rigged. They've been given a choice between a lady who I've been tracking since the mid nineteen nineties. You know, I I I, I published a book in nineteen ninety five called "And the Truth Shall Set You Free." which gave chapter and verse of the background to the Clintons, um, including even then the size of the body count, the number of people who um, had things on the Clinton or had crossed the Clintons who were suddenly no longer with us. And, and, and that has gone on and on and on. But at least four people connected to this, um, uh, this, well, outrageous scandal of the way the Democratic Party manipulated um, uh, the, uh, the candidacy to uh, Clinton uh, over Bernie Sanders. At least four people connected with that and exposing it are now dead. It seems you cross the Clintons and you suddenly have this overwhelming desire to commit suicide. Um, and, and you've got this uh, ordinary level of corruption with the, um, the Clinton Foundation, where um, she's supposed to be standing as the the first woman president, uh, the emancipation for women, and one of the biggest donors to the Clinton Foundation. It's the Saudi royal family. Yeah, they believe in emancipation of women. Um, and then you've got, as you point out, this health situation. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's widely talked about in America, but not by the mainstream media. Not by the mainstream media, except to, 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 to uh, discredit any idea that there's a problem. But she's clearly got some kind of uh, brain function problem. And they hide it by saying she's got pneumonia or she's overheating. I was in New York. I mean, you know, I, I'm well known among my family for, for ha having a thermostat that doesn't really work that great. I don't like it very hot. and I don't like it very cold. Uh, and, and New York, when I was there, was very, very hot, except on one day when it was just like an English summer's day. And that was the day, and I was very close to where it happened. Um, that was the day that Clinton was supposed to have overheated and almost collapsed. Uh, oh, she did collapse. Yes, yeah, she did. Uh, and and, and um, the idea it was overheating, of course, that didn't stand up. So they, they then came out with the pneumonia and all this stuff. Um, but the thing about Hillary Clinton, is that she is a representative of this hidden hand absolutely down to her uh, fingernails, her DNA. And thus, the reason they want her in, ideally, although Trump will do for them, um, is because she will uh, uh, not only do whatever they want, but she will do it with gusto and um, want to do it. No manipulation necessary. And her first priority, if she gets into the White House, will be to um, uh, push on this um, series of events to World War III. She's already doing it in her election campaign while I was out there. Over and over, she will, she will have um, Putin and Russia um, as the demon in her, in her, in her narrative, in, in her speech. Um, and then you've got on the other side, um, you've got... Um, Donald Trump is supposed to be anti-establishment. Well, his whole career has been interacting with these establishment figures. 
Um, and both of them, both of them are on their knees to Israel. So that's the Palestinians stitched up for another term. Um, and both of them believe um, in, in increasing the bombing in Syria and creating what they call no-fly zones. Both of them say that. So then you have the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Chiefs of Staff at the Pentagon um, this week on Capitol Hill saying that, um, yes, they could introduce safe zones, so, so no-fly zones, in other words, where only the U.S. coalition can fly. So it's not a no-fly zone, really. It's a no-fly for people we don't like zone. But he said on Capitol Hill, this chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, yes, we can have a, a no-fly zone, but it will mean going to war with Syria and Russia. So um, Clinton's the, the, the one they want, but, but Trump's perfectly acceptable to them. Now, uh, speaking of the censorship and speaking of uh, uh, Hillary's health, I don't know whether, whether you know about it. On Monday, Michael Savage, and God bless the guy, I like him, uh, he was taken off the air, 400 affiliates in the United States because of him talking about Hillary's health. Have you heard of it? Yeah, I, I caught that. I caught that story just before I left um, Los Angeles. Um, see, this is another uh, classic um, example of censoring that information which will challenge the official narrative. Uh, and this censorship is increasing all the time for, for a, a, a very simple reason. Um, the alternative media in all its different uh, facets and forms has started to seriously impact upon people's perceptions. And they're terrified of what's been happening. Uh, thus, they want to shut down anybody who's going to tell uh, uh, anything that will uh, put the official narrative um, in, in question. And the official narrative that she doesn't have a health problem is, is I'll, I'll tell you from talking to Americans, uh, traveling around America and just chatting in airports and stuff like that. Um, they know, the vast majority of them absolutely know that um, she has a serious health problem. Uh, but what you've got there, and this is the way it's been played, when I talk to people about why they're voting for Clinton, they say invariably, not everybody, of course, but invariably, because she's not Trump. Why are you voting for Trump? Because he's not Clinton. Uh, and, and you know, of all the elections I've ever seen, um, the number of people that in that country that want neither of them is ridiculously high. Um, so the the scene is set in in the public mind there to be open to um, other explanations for what's happening in terms of her health and. And, and these strange things that are happening, being helped up uh, small flights of steps, etc. And so um, anything that's going to highlight that, anyone's got a decent sized audience who, who can get that information out, hey, what about this? Um, then it's more and more likely they're going to be shut down. That's the way it works. The next question is, <clears throat> there is a large group of Christians who follow you, your work Although most of the churches would not talk about the New World Order and the global shadow government, a lot of Christians are losing their illusion about the world we live in. Should we or shouldn't we believe in the Savior? Well, I don't come, I don't come from a religious point of view uh, at all. Um, but um, I, 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 from what I was, I've been reading, you know, there's a lot of people who, who are coming from that direction in, in the Czech Republic. But um, for me, what people believe um, is basically none of my business. Um, I get interested, and everyone should get interested, when people start imposing their beliefs on others, when they start in, in, uh, 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 insisting that people have uh, their, the, the beliefs that they have. You know, uh, you can um, follow a religion, and you can come at it from, from a position and you can you can live a very loving life through that religion or 
you can come at it from another angle and you can you can you can live a very unpleasant very violent life through that same religion i mean you know there are endless um uh christians coming from a heart position and there are other people who call themselves christians through the ages who created mayhem violence and slaughter and now of course the same applies to the muslim religion you know some of the some of the um the nicest, kindest, most generous people I've met in my life have been Muslims. I don't agree with their religion at all, but but they 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 live their lives like that. And then there are others, of course, who are um, extraordinary in the the levels of violence that they uh, are just through the same religion that others justify being peaceful and kind. So it's not the religion; it's 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 it's, it's how you um, how you live your life through it. But you know, for me, you know, we don't need middle men and women between us and the what I would call infinite awareness um, that we're all part of. We we can tap into that direct. You know, um, uh, we don't we don't need um, intermediaries to tell us what what God wants us to do and what will happen if we don't we can we can tap into that greater self that greater um, reality without having someone in between um, acting as a go-between uh, but, but, but you know it, people people live their lives they believe what and do what they like it's the imposition that um, I challenge um, and you see the imposition. You see it in purely in statistics. Um, if you're born into a Muslim family, the vast, overwhelming chance is you're going to live your life as a Muslim um, or, or, or follow that religion. If you li if you brought up as a Christian in the southern states of America, you're almost certainly going to live your life as a Christian. You're brought up in Tel Aviv or New York. You're um, uh, in in a, in, a, in the Jewish faith you're almost certainly going to follow Judaism uh, 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 as a religion, um, if you're going to follow any religion at all. So you can see this cause and effect. What I would say is set the children free. You know, if, if, if the religion you, you choose to have um, has validity, then people will see that and come by free choice and not by having to be told that this is what they should do. Um, I think, you know, I'm sick and tired of this world where constantly, from cradle to grave, people are told what they are, what they should think, what they should be, what they should believe, what they should say, what they shouldn't say. We've got to set each other free because the greatest form of censorship is that which people impose on each other without even the authorities being involved. The next one is a philosophical question. In cultures with uh, Manichaean and Abrahamic religious influence, evil is usually perceived as a dualistic, antagonistic opposite of a good. Now the question, is this dualism real and should we live according its perception? Do you agree that this is just a projection of our mind so we can live in the system, in the reality we created by using dualism? Is it why religions created gods and devils? Well, um, first of all, I mean, I, I, I talk about this in the event in Prague on uh, next Saturday, week on Saturday. Um, what's interesting is there was a new kind of psyche, a new way of seeing the world, um, which came out of the Middle East and North Africa about 6,000 years ago. Um, and... It was, it transformed the way societies lived, the way they were organized, and so much violence came with it and desire to, to, to um, impose its will upon people. Um, and I, I go into this, it's, there's quite a little backstory. Um, and the religions you're talking about, um, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, they came out of that same area that this psyche came out, the, the expressions of each other, 
And for me, I mean, let's pull the two questions together when we're talking about reality. Um, because this is kept from people, and it's not taught in the schools, certainly won't when I was, and not, not here with not my children. Um, when you say to people, when you, when you look out of your eyes, what do you see? Do you see everything there is to see? And people go, oh, yeah, of course I do. Well, they don't. They see a tiny, tiny frequency range, which is so ludicrously narrow, it's laughable. According to mainstream science, um, the electromagnetic spectrum is 0.005% of what exists in matter, energy, etc., in this universe. And visible light, which is the only frequency band that we can actually turn into a visual reality, is a fraction of the 0.005%. Within that, uh, within that um, visible light band, the planet that we think we're on is, according to mainstream science, compared to the projected uh, size of the universe, equivalent to one billionth of a pinhead. And yet, inside 0.005%, inside uh, a billionth of a pinhead, there is this belief that all we need to know is between the covers of a single book, whatever religion it may be. In the myopia of that is staggering, stunning. Um, and beyond this frequency band we can see is, is infinity, an infinity of awareness, infinity of consciousness, infinity of realities very different to this one. Um, and, and so what I mean, I call, personally, I've been calling it for years, and religion, the greatest form of mind control ever invented. Because it's, it's, it's a state, religion is, it is a state of induced myopia. A, a, a state of um, an induced sense of extreme limitation. Because if you, this is what this postage stamp consensus I talk about, this real world normal is all about. It's about focusing, focusing people's perceptions of everything within such a narrow band of possibility, ludicrously narrow band of possibility, that when anyone comes along and says, actually, this is happening, people say, that's impossible, that's ridiculous, you're mad, that can't be happening. Just, no, it can't be happening within your perception of, of limitation, but it is actually happening. Um, and religion has played a major part in putting people in these uh, uh, states of, my, uh, of uh, myopia, where um, anything beyond them is dismissed and and, and people have, how many people through the centuries have been burned at the stake, beheaded, whatever, right up to present day, because they uh, had a vision of possibility that was outside the, uh, the covers of a single book. Um, that's got to change. All right, David, we're second to last. Because if they don't, we're, then this is going to go on. Second to last. David, what is your biggest personal wish in today's world? That people love each other. That people realize that the perceptions we have of being apart from everything and apart from each other is just an illusion of the... Uh, decoding process of the human mind, the human, uh, what I call biological computer. Um, there is, there has been throughout the ages, right to present day, this recurring thing, and quantum physics is, is, is delved more and more into this area now, of everything being um, one, one field of energy, one field of awareness, one field of consciousness. And we are points of attention within this awareness. This point of attention is called David Icke. Uh, that point of attention is called Norbert. But with the same consciousness, the same infinite awareness having different experiences, what um, happens within the illusory realm of the five senses is that the way they decode reality, this holographic, illusory, physical reality, is that everything's apart from everything else. And once you have that perception of everything, then the potential for divide and rule and playing off the parts 
to, to control the whole are infinite. Once you go to another level of awareness where you, uh, you can see that everything is just an expression of the same consciousness, then um, this potential for divide and rule and playing people off against each other is massively reduced. And if you get expand enough, then it's deleted. And it's, it's no accident that this world is run as if it's solid, as if this world is real, as if everything is apart from everything else. This is how science looks at the world, quantum physics apart. It's how medicine looks at the world, politics, uh, the media, all of it. And thus, the laws and the way that human society interacts and the way it's organized is based on a fundamental uh, delusion and misunderstanding of the very reality we're experiencing. And uh, through the ages, when people have come to the fore called seers or, or um, uh, thinkers outside the box, etc., cetera, um, when they've, they've come and spoken about this, the fact that reality is not how we think it is, They've always been jumped upon by authority. This authority doesn't want people realizing we're all one. Doesn't uh, um, want people to realize that. I mean, how do you sell arms? How do you make arms? How do you use arms when you know we're all one? But if you can persuade people that your genetic line or your religion is somehow more special than everyone else, and then they're not like you and they're, they're, they're evil and all that stuff, then people can justify to themselves this, this, these horrors that they do. When if we just realize that actually we're just different experiences of the same uh, awareness experiencing itself, then, um, then, then we can start to realize that all this fighting, all this conflict, all this desire to get one over on someone else, is all a nonsense. It's all a, a delusion. Because, you know, if we work together, there'd be no hunger. There'd be no one uh, homeless. There'd be no one um, uh, cold. Uh, none of these things are necessary. They happen because of the way the system's uh, are, are structured, and it's systematically structured to bring about that society. And uh, it's very simple. We want to change the world to something better. We better change to something better. Because if we don't, the world ain't going to change. Because the world is merely a collective expression of the state of human consciousness. I do agree with you that we have to really change before we want to change the world. The last question is, as a part of your worldwide wake-up tour, uh, you will be live at Lucerna in Prague, Czech Republic on 8th of October 2016. What can people look forward to comparing it to your last visit in 2010? which was, by the way, a very fantastic event. Well, it, 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 it's an interesting question because, um, you, you know, we all have it. You have it. All people have it. Um, when suddenly um, the kaleidoscope moves and you see things in greater and greater clarity. And that's happened to me over and over again in the last, like, two years. And I never uh, go out on a speaking tour unless... What I'm saying has, has moved on. It's got more clarity. It's got more information. And, and you know, I, in, in America, in the last three weeks, uh, people were coming up to me afterwards and saying, um, I've seen you speak before, but I've never seen that. Um, it's light years ahead of what I did uh, last time I was in um, uh, the Czech Republic. Light years ahead of what I did before this tour started, the last one in 2014. Um, it's, it's just massively expanded and, uh, uh, I couldn't be more happy with, um, with, with the way it's come together. All right, David, thank you very much for answering, uh, these questions, uh, for your, uh, fans. I'm looking forward to meeting you on Tuesday next week and we're going to conduct a, a little bit different interview.